many of you know, today, starting at 2 o'clock, we went through a very rigorous examination process for all my students. They got evaluated, um, very good, excellent, satisfactory, and were graded on all their performance pieces. And our lovely evaluator decided to give you all a gift back to put herself on the evaluation side and give you guys some music. So she's love. She's excited to share some music with you guys. She's going to talk about the history and talk about stage fright. It's going to be a more educational process. Also, many of you guys had to use a new harp today. How many of you guys used a new harp that you would never played on before or hadn't played on for weeks? Like, most of you guys hadn't played on the harp. Jackie has never played on my harp before, and since it has the pedals and all the strings, it'll be just as uncomfortable as it was for most of you guys today. So she is in the exact same spot as you. Um, anyway, let's welcome Jackie. Um, well, thank you guys for having me, and thank you so much for playing for me today. It was really a pleasure to listen to all of you. And as Crystal said, I didn't think that it was fair that you guys were in the hot spot all day. So I thought that I would play, you know, play a little bit for you and just tell you a little bit about how, you know, sort of how I think about performing and something about the history of the pieces and just a couple things to sort of round out your understanding of um, just playing the harp, basically. And so one thing I would say before I start is that one of the major points of having you guys come here today to play was to practice performing because it's really important to practice not just your music at home, but to practice actually performing and getting out there and playing in front of other people. Because I, I don't know what it is, if it's something turns on or something turns off, but something is different when you're performing for other people. And the only way to get better at it is by practicing. And the only way to practice performing is to get out and play in front of people. So that's great that you guys came today to do this, and this will be great practice for me as well. It's a, sort of a lifelong skill that we're always honing to getting better at performing and playing the harp. So. I look forward to getting myself some more experience today, too. The first piece I'm going to play for you guys is called Song of the Night, and it's by Carlos Salzedo, who is a very famous, uh, was a very famous harpist and who pioneered a lot in harp technique. And one of the things that he did in this piece, he wanted to show off what the harp could do, so he wrote a lot of what we call sort of extended technique or modern technique. So you'll hear me use my nails on the harp, you'll hear me hit the soundboard, and do just a number of other things that you really wouldn't quite expect from the harp. But it's still a really beautiful piece and um, has just a lot of effects. So I hope that you enjoy. This is going to be Song in the Night by Carlos Salcedo. Thank you. 
lot of the different things that Harp can do, but one of my favorite things about that piece is that it incorporates so, such a huge range of expression on the harp that it all still comes together to give you this feeling of a song in the night and you're going on a journey. So I always love that. And I'm gonna ask Crystal to come up here and fudge around with the tuning for a second while I tell them about the next piece. Um, so a lot of you are playing the lever harp um, and some of you guys are starting to play the pedal harp and some of you guys' feet doesn't even reach the pedals. Um, but there's always the option of moving to the lever harp at some point if you want to. The, or sorry, the pedal harp. The lever harp is great too. Um, my specialty happens to be in the pedal harp, so I'm going to play you guys a piece that's uh, sort of a showcase for the pedals. Not so much for the fingers, but for the pedals. It's another piece by Carlos Salzedo, and it, uh, it involves some of those um, extended techniques, but mostly it makes a sort of melody out of the sounds that the pedals make as they change. So the, there's three notches and for three pitches, flat, natural, and sharp on each string. So when you plug one and you move the pedal and the string's still ringing, you hear a buzz. And most of the time, we try with all our might to not have these buzzes. But in this case, I am trying to have these buzzes very rhythmically and you'll hear uh, very clearly a melody out of it. And you'll see sometimes that I'll have played something and you'll be hearing a little melody, but you won't see my hands playing anything. And that's because I'm using my feet. And I accidentally left my special pedal shoes in the other room. So I'm just gonna play this one barefooted because um, sometimes the shoes I'm wearing right now stick a little bit on really difficult pieces. But um, of course I ask you to, no, there's nothing in particular. Like, yeah, was a little, of course I ask you to do that right before you play Desert Rod and like, you know, play really hard on your heart. But well, we uh, had some uh, string issues to it, we, so they were almost all of them yes, new. So. Yes, one thing that happens a lot to all of us musicians, but particularly harp, it's because we have so many is strings break and then put them back on and it takes forever for them to tune. So Crystal's harp just got restrung, so it's got a great sound but we have to work with it <laughs> in terms of intonation. So anyhow, this is La Deserade by Carlos Salcedo.
contrast. So we're going to go from that to a Baroque piece. And if I could ask you again to help me out. I'm sorry, I hate to be such a stickler no. about it, but especially with a with handle, it'll, yes. it'll, it'll sound. But So the next thing I'm going to play for you is a handle concerto for harp in B flat. I'm going to play the first movement of it for you, which is something that us harpists you guys will all come to know because it is just a huge staple of our repertoire. Uh, I'm playing a version that was arranged by Salzato. Uh, the way that it wor worked in the Baroque era with concertos is um, a composer would compose a concerto and, then this, and it would be a fairly skeletal in nature. There wouldn't necessarily be a lot of ornaments that they wrote in. That was left up to the performer and often the performer improvised that. So. A uh, composer would sit down on the performer's stand with this very skeletal outline, you know, just the melodies and the harmonies, sort of in some ways like a lead sheet. It was a little bit more filled out than that, but the performer would add in all the ornaments and all of the decorative features of the piece. So uh, what we do nowadays a lot of times is play transcriptions that, that a harpist has written out all these ornaments that you would normally do sort of in concert, and so this particular version is uh, transcribed by Salzato, the guy who wrote the earlier pieces, but you won't hear anything too crazy because it's a Baroque concerto, and so he wrote appropriately for that. So the original concerto is a much, much more simple than what I'm going to play. What I'm gonna play is a little bit of a virtuosic showpiece for those of us that decide we wanna spend all our lives in the practice room. Um, the other thing I wanna tell you guys about this is, um, that Handel wrote it in 1736, and he wrote it as part of an oratorio uh, called Alexander's Feast. And it was, it's called Alexander's Feast or the Power of Music. And it was written to celebrate um, the feast day of St. Cecilia, who's the patron saint of music, uh, and musicians in particular. And the entire thing is about how music can rouse so many passions in people and uh, take them over a great a great um, sort of expanse of emotions and in this uh, um, in the, so in the story where we're at when the harp concerto comes in is and a lot of times handle put concertos as sort of interludes just in between uh, when everybody was moving on and off stage just to sort of set the mood a little more and make it a really enjoyable evening. But So where we are in the story of Alexander's Feast is Alexander the Great has just conquered the city of Persepolis, which is was the biggest um, city in Persia and it's the head of the Persian Empire. And so he has just gone in there and, ta and taken over and it's, he's really happy about it because about a hundred years before that, the Persians burned down Athens and the Acropolis and he's Greek so he was not so happy with them. So he finally goes and expands his empire and takes over at Persepolis and he is having a feast in the palace. And so uh, when the harp comes in, it's just very much towards the beginning of the piece, and they're just talking about how great it, you know, how great it is to basically be them. They just won the war, and so they want to celebrate and have a good time and not think at all of bad things. We'll come back to that in a second because I want to tell you how the story ends. It's very interesting. So Alexander and his friends start having a really good time. They're having a lot of drinks, a lot. And then they decide that it's a really good idea to burn down this palace. And this is a palace that held just tons of scientific and, and artistic wonders of the time. So it's really a huge tragedy, but you know, they really got going and they burned down, they burned down the whole palace. And so it's sort of a little bit of a sad ending, but one of the ways that the music really relates to all of this is that throughout the music is invoking these feelings in the people on stage and they're reacting accordingly. So after the harp concerto is played, uh, everybody is happy and hanging around and just having a good time. And later on, uh, when the musician, who's one of the main characters in this uh, little oratorio, uh, plays them a, um, a more rousing, sort of warlike tune, they remember about how their city, how the Greeks remember how their city had been burned down a hundred years before. They get so upset that they just decide to destroy this, you know, really amazing thing. So that's sort of like where the story goes. But the great thing for us is that 
right before the Heart Concerto comes in, everybody's talking about how great music is and how amazing it is and how joyous it can be. So I wanted to read you just a little thing that the tenor sings right before the harp comes in, just to give you an idea of what kind of mood we're going for here. Um, the tenor sings, Timotheus placed on high amid the tuneful choir with flying fingers touch the lyre. The trembling notes ascend the sky and heavenly joys inspire. So with that said, I will play you the first movement of Handel's Concerto for Harp.
called today, which is when you make a mistake, don't make a face. <laughs> I've tried my hardest to keep it keep it straight, but I know I know how hard it can be, so I just wanted to remind you guys as I remind myself, if you make a mistake, don't let it show. Because so many times I'll bet there are there are so many times when I play so many things and I feel like I made a mistake, but if I don't let it show, afterwards I'll ask audience members and they'll say, We had really we had no idea. No idea. So it's really important to remember that when you're performing. I remind myself constantly and so that I would remind you guys. Um, I will now go on to a piece that I transcribed myself. Uh, it's called Lotus Land, and it's by a composer named Cyril Scott, who uh, lived to be about almost 100 years old. He lived from the late 1800s to the 1980s, and he was, he's not very well known as a composer, but he was a contemporary of Debussy and Ravel, and they all admired his work, and you can really hear a lot of that uh, French Impressionist style in here. But one thing that's interesting about this piece, he wrote it um, just as he started to get into sort of Eastern mysticism and a lot of things with magical thinking and the occult, so you'll really hear that influence in here. Um, and like I said, this is a piece I transcribed. It was originally for solo piano, and I spent quite a long time reworking it to make it for make it work for the harp. I had to change a lot of notes and move things around, but uh, I think that it's a really, I think that it was a very worthwhile endeavor because I think it's a great piece. So I hope that you guys enjoy. This is Lotus Land by Cyril Scott.
She was um, a French composer around the turn of the century in France. She lived also quite a long time. Um, and so even though most of her work was in France was done around then, she moved all over the place and in 1957 wrote her sonata for harp. Um, I'm going to be playing the third movement for you all, which is called Perpetual Motion. Uh, you'll see why. Uh, but Perpetual Motion is actually a genre of, um, of it's, it's, it's a genre in itself. And it is known for its steady, constant rhythms and generally a uh, good level of virtuosity. So hopefully I'll be up to the task today, but I think it's a really great, great movement. And uh, you'll have to forgive me while I fiddle around over here. I want to make sure that my bench and everything's at the, the right height, but then I will play for you the third movement of German Tefer's Sonata for Harp entitled Perpetual Motion.
and like talk to me and ask me what my favorite color is, how long I'm playing a harp, anything like that, you're more than welcome to. But uh, as far as the me playing part, that is that's uh, that's the end of it. But I wanted to let, let you guys. I know everybody's had a long day, so you're free to go. And if you want to ask me questions, feel free to come by. I'm here to answer all of your questions, including how many mistakes did I make, how nervous was I. You know, I, I just want to tell you guys so that you know what it's really like from the perspective of someone who sits down and does this on a somewhat more regular basis, you know, how I do it and why. So thank you for having me. Well, let's give another round of applause. seven of them that run up the column and into the neck and there's over 2,000 moving parts in just the neck so despite being an ancient instrument we've sure got a lot going on <laughs> she's driving next week she oh you are yeah. wonderful you, are. you too how I, gosh I've been playing for um, 19 years so I'm 26 I started when I was seven which doesn't mean that you have to start when you're seven I know um, seven. You're seven? <laughs> <laughs> perfect! That's absolutely perfect. But I know I know a lot of, lots of harpists that have started at many points in their life. Um, one of my one of my great mentors um, is uh, the harpist in the Alley Philharmonic, but she didn't start until she was 14. So if you don't get a head start, it's totally okay. But if you can start when you're seven, all the better. Yeah. <laughs> How hard is it for you to reach the bass strings? Um, kind of far away. Not yeah, they are a little far away. I mean, when so, you know, I spend all this time playing and have to really, uh, when you get to a high level, you really have to focus a lot on ergonomics. Uh, it's not really such an issue when you're first starting because you're not spending that many hours at it and you're young and, <laughs> and I'm young too, but still you have to really worry about your body. So the most comfortable position to play the harp in is, you know, you really like hold it up with your shoulders and everything. So for me, the hardest thing is it's not so much physically difficult to reach as it is uncomfortable if it's sustained. So it's uncomfortable for me to spend a really long time really down on the bass wires. Like if I'm moving up and down, it's fine. But there's actually a lot of orchestral pieces that have a lot of harp solos down here. So when I'm at home practicing those, I really have to take a, um, take a lot of breaks and make sure I'm using the right muscles. Otherwise, I'll start to get really tense and that's not good for anybody. It's actually, I would say on that note, sometimes high, it was actually the most difficult for me in this concert to get some of these notes because you start running out of room a little bit at the very top and your hand doesn't really fit in there so well. So just, and that's just something that happens on most harps and it's different from model to model. And this harp, I'm lucky, has like a lot of room until you get to the very, very top. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's, my answer to that question? Yes? Which piece was the hardest string? The large. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that the handle's the hardest for me. Um, it's just every moment, every moment of playing the handle is like all fingers on all hands are totally engaged, you know. And um, the handle is also it's I I think it's a treacherous piece to perform in the way that um, you can really follow the melody, and so if something happens, it's really obvious. And it also was written in 1736, which means that there are no weird notes in it. If you heard weird notes in Handel, that was all my fault. If you heard weird notes in Thai Fair, some of them are supposed to be there. So, um, <laughs> so that's why I think the Handel's so hard to play. Um, so for me, that was the hardest. Yes? Do you 
you only play solo, or have you played with a, an orchestra? Or yeah. Any other? Well, I actually primarily do orchestral work, so that's um, definitely what I do do the most. I just graduated from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, um, and so played with a lot of regional orchestras. Um, I came down at Christmas to play with Valley San Jose here, so I just do as much orchestral work as I can all over the place, and um, a lot of it in LA as well. That's where I'm from, so I do a lot there. But I definitely do orchestral playing. I love playing with other people. I mean, playing by myself, in my mind, it is you know just for me personally is you know it's it's fine. But I love collaborating with other musicians, and I love what really happens when you start working with another musician and, and really communicating directly with another person via sound. So it's a, that's always been very meaningful for me. But um, of course, I still like playing by myself, and um, I love I love the harp so much. So I'm happy to play it whenever I can. Um, yeah. so when did you click? Like, when did it click for you when you were, or what age did you go, this is for me and I can't believe that I get to play this every day? Oh gosh. Um, this probably sounds overly romantic, and I'm sure in some ways it is, but from I loved it a lot from the very beginning. Um, I didn't know that it's what I wanted to do as a living, and I, I would say that some of the moments that I really remember where I didn't think, I, did, I couldn't, you know, at times when I couldn't ever think of doing anything else, um, I remember in, um, in my sophomore year of college, I was going to UCLA as a music major, and um, I was hired to go to Banff in Canada. It's a really beautiful place, and play just all this beautiful music and with these other great musicians, and I remembered, um, just playing, I was playing this really beautiful harp solo called Introduction and Allegro, and when you hear it, it just is the best thing in the world. And I remember I was playing it, and it was for harp and chamber, so there was string quartet, uh, flute and clarinet, and the harp, and the harp was soloist, and I just remember playing and just thinking that I was the luckiest person in the world, and that even though there are some times that are, that are hard, you know, you gotta practice long hours, you know, people don't always appreciate what you do. There's not always a whole lot of jobs, or there's, you know, these things. But it just, in that moment, made you think that I do it over again every time. Because it was just so wonderful. I, I can't even stop smiling thinking about it, because it just was such a special feeling that I've, I've never had doing anything else. So that's, I would say, when I was... For sure, never going back, you know, never never going back with anything. But I've definitely always really liked the harp a lot. And um, from the time I was in grade school, or probably middle school, started to think about if I could make a career out of it or do something with it. So. Yes, sir? The last two notes, it looks like there's no thing that that is, that, or Yeah, that is very, very, very... Um, uh, perceptive of you. The very last two notes do not have these on there, and I believe from what the heart makers tell me <laughs> is that um, there's a lot, there's a ton of tension on all of the strings. It's something like 2,000 pounds of pressure, and for these, for these two, um, th not only the m mechanics of getting this long of a string um, to change into like that low of pitches. I mean, this is pretty much the bottom of the piano. There's not a whole lot of pitch that goes below that. And then to additionally deal with the extra tension that that would add on to the harp when you would um, put it in sharp, that that would just be really extreme and that it's not really worth it for these bottom two notes. But they decided that it was worth it all the way down to there. So what we do is much like you do with a lever harp, you just tune it beforehand. So when I only use this one in this concert, I need, needed a D sharp and it's a D, so I turned it to a D sharp. Um, but that is, that's a very good observation. Yeah. This happens a lot on the very top string, too. Um, that a lot of times the very top string won't have the discs either because it's just asking to break it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? How do you transport something that size when you go from these, you know... Kind and loving parents. I mean, you have to have a large car um, to be able to put it. And and a lot of people. What do you have a station? Yeah, station American wagons are great. Audi TC, but not Audi's work. Um, yeah, this is work. Well, most of the big station wagons work. 
Yeah, and there's a big station wagon or uh, SUV, our car. minivan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the day I've definitely put, I think the smallest car I've ever put my harp in was a Toyota Matrix. I think there was a hatchback. Um, was the back open? But, uh, no, the back was not open. Um, I did have to put down the passenger seat, though, and the harp kind of like rode up front with me, sort of upside down. It was not the best day of my life, but I was desperate, so. <laughs> my car broke down and that was the only person who could drive me and so we had to make it work which is what you do when you become a performer let me tell you what about flying though how do you fly something that size oh I, I, I personally try to never fly I mean we have giant harp cases they're just monstrosities is they they're like this big over here and up here and they're um, we have like a soft cover to just get it around normally but this thing is like uh, it's hard, made of wood or, or, you know, carbon fiber or whatever, you know, depending on where you get it from. Um, and it's totally padded on the inside and the harp goes in there and they're just huge. They're terribly difficult to move. And there's still a good chance that the uh, people at the airline will throw it around anyways. So we generally try really hard um, not to fly with them. And since you can adjust to other harps, even though it's not necessarily ideal, I'm sure you guys know, um, you can adjust to other harps, so if you go, when I travel out of town, I just play on a harp that's there. Um, what big orchestras do, like when the San Francisco Symphony goes on tour, they actually have, they take their harps with them, but they have a crew that's very specially trained in handling the instruments, including the harps, and they have, they have full control over the instruments the whole time, so they don't sort of have to deal with that. Um, very, very dangerous thing that is putting your luggage under an airplane, you know? Well, I mean, they still put it under there, but they're loading it very carefully. They're not just leaving it in the hands of, you know, whoever's been working their 12-hour shift and is not happy to have this big honker and just throws it in, so. <laughs> yes, sir? How come you moved up in two years? I did not. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> no! <laughs> might look like that, but, oh, oh girl, no, <laughs> but no, I, 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 I am pretty much, I, I am not pretty much, I'm 100% sure I didn't, but I can see occasionally when someone's playing, especially when they're playing really fast, it just looks like they're all moving, and the peaky right in there, it looks like it gets close, but I didn't. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I didn't expect that one. <laughs> no, it's fine, no, don't worry about it. Yes? Do you get calluses on your fingers? Yes, I've started playing the harp. It kind of hurts sometimes. Yeah, well, the good the good news is that they they sort of build up over time. You're welcome to come up afterwards and look at my fingers. You can kind of see them a little bit. Um, they're, they're not anything too gnarly. Like, you're not going to walk around with layers and layers and layers of, you know, whatever grows there when you get a callus. Um, but you will start to develop a callus so that it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Like when I touch the harp or when I play the harp, it, do, it doesn't hurt at all. But I still have a lot of sensitivity in my fingers because, well, I mean, you need to at some point. Um, but I still have that sensitivity, but it's sort of like the, the tender flesh type thing is, uh, it doesn't stay for that long. But it will get a little red and a little raw. Just make sure that you don't get any blisters because that's just, then you have to totally stop, wait for it to heal then start again. But if I put my pinkies on the harp, which I never do, um, <laughs> but I have done from time to time to experiment with the callus thing, they, I get that same feeling if I, if I pluck strings very much with them. It, it's, it gets kind of red and it, it's just a little, so it just kind of hurts, but um, it'll get better for sure. And it won't take too long, so keep at it. Yes, ma'am? How old is the harp? I don't know. How old is this harp? This particular <coughs> Do you want to know harps or generally general? or this harp? Testing my knowledge, I bought it used from a lady who bought it for her daughter, so I think it's uh, at least 30 years old, if not 25, but it's been around for a while. So 25, 30 years? And go back in history to like what time? To like the third millennia BC. It's, they found figurines, um, you might have seen them, these Cycladic figurines from, from ancient, uh, ancient, ancient Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. um, 
they've got little ones of um, someone playing a harp. Obviously, it wasn't, <laughs> didn't have 2,000 moving parts, um, but it's just a wood harp. And um, other than like the human voice and percussion type stuff, which is just because you can bang on whatever is near you and you can make sounds with your own voice, the harp and um, something along the lines of a reed flute or some of the most ancient instruments because to make a crude harp, you really just need three pieces of wood and some sort of string type thing. I mean, I've made really crude, um, they're called gut buckets, but if you just get, if you just get some sort of something that's like sort of round and you, uh, you know, put a pole up, you can like strap strings on it going that way. And this is something like, I am no mechanic or anything like that, but just using the basic knowledge of just, you know, the sort of triangle shape and getting some sort of something that you can put tight enough that when you when you pluck it, it'll vibrate at a pitch that we can all hear. That's you've got the beginnings of harps, so they go back quite a long way. Yes. Aside from when your string breaks, how often do you replace them? Um, it it depends. Generally, I'd say. Well, I would say for me that um, I'd replace the the top ones or all the, these objects at least once a year just based on them breaking alone. And I keep track of when my other strings break. And so I, I, the answer is once a year. Um, but I sort of like just let these guys come in and out as they will. And then at the end of the year, I look back and I, if there's one that's been on there for a year or one that's looked really, looks really frayed and out of it, I'll take that off. Sometimes I go two years in between putting on bass wires, but that's only when I'm really poor. <laughs> yeah. So why are some of the strings a different color? Is oh, uh, they are uh, color-coded. Uh, the Cs are red and the Fs are black. And all the other notes are sort of in between. So this is an octave, this is Cs and Fs. Which I know lots of us here have probably spent a lot of time thinking about black notes and red notes and all the other ones in between. Uh, but so it's just a, if you wanted to hear a scale, um, like a C major swell, based on the you just go from you know one red string to the other. And you know, just for some extra harp info, the very top strings are nylon, the middle ones are gut, the bottom ones are actually gut wrapped in wire. And the addition of the wire on the outside of the gut helps to keep it strong because like by the time that you get to strings that are, are this long, you, you really need a sturdy, sturdy string. So they wrap the gut in wire. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. If any of you guys think of any more questions, I'll, I'll be out there uh, eating and <laughs> 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 such.